And we're live. Yeah, make some noise, everybody. OK, gang. Hello to everyone joining us at home uh, via the live stream. Great to see you. Please make sure you get in there and you leave your questions. We're here at GC Hollywood, and we got a great event for you tonight. A little bit of housekeeping. What we're going to do is we're going to get a very special guest up here. And he's going to play his guitar. He's going to crush it. And then we're going to line everybody up. We'll do some autographs. We're all going to have a good time. So if you guys are on the stream, make sure you drop your questions. Everybody in here, if you want to ask a question, we're going to have a mic set up right here. You can just jump on up, and then we'll all be able to hear what your question is. And so now here he comes, everybody. He's on the road right now with Tesseract. He is on the road to GC Tampa in just a few days. And... He is here for you, thanks to Schechter and D'Addario, Aaron Marshall, a.k.a. Intervals. How's everybody doing? Cool. Thanks so much for coming, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you to Guitar Center and Schechter and D'Addario for hosting me. And uh, this is sweet. This is my first time ever at Guitar Center Hollywood. I've uh, been to a few Guitar Centers. Not in Hollywood, though, so this is kind of cool. Really nice room. Happy to be here. Any any of you guys at the show last night? Anybody come to not? Okay, couple. Nice. Sweet. Missed opportunity, friends. Missed opportunity. We'll do it again in the spring, yeah? Okay, cool. All right, listen, let me grab a guitar, and then we'll kind of get into it a little bit. So many guitars. How do you choose one? <laughs> so I'll give you a little preamble on how I typically do a clinic. Um, not a big fan of having a bunch of pre-prepared stuff to talk about. This is going to largely be Q&A based, so you guys are going to steer. Uh, I'm going to play some songs, and um, we're going to sort of flip between that and answering some questions for you guys and talking about whatever it is that you guys want to get into. So usually I'll, I'll start by uh, surveying the audience a little bit and, and asking. This is probably a pretty obvious question to ask at a Guitar Center clinic, but who here plays guitar? Yeah, I knew that. Okay, who here is composing music or writing music, actively doing so? Nice, very good, very good. Who here plays in a band? Nice, very good. Uh, anybody have any interest in drums or bass or any anything? Yeah, just a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> only kind of? Yeah, exactly, very good. Wicked. So yeah, I usually like to kind of start there and just figure out, you know, what the maybe the consensus amongst the audience is in terms of what what it is that our interests are. Um, you know, you guys can feel free to ask me questions about pretty much anything as it pertains to music stuff, the world of intervals. You know, it can be gear stuff, composition, technique, whatever. Probably no life advice. I live in a black box on the freeway with eight other degenerates, so don't ask me about life advice, but. Um, let's do this. I'll start with a tune, and uh, and then we'll just kind of get into it. So if you guys want to think about some questions to kick off with while I make a little noise, we'll do that, and then we'll uh, we'll rock from there. So let's put a guitar in tune. I'll give you a little preamble before I get into this, actually. So uh, we're currently on tour with Tesseract and Alluvial, and uh, we're about a week and a half away from the end. Um, kicked off early October. And I uh, got about nine more shows to go. So we put a song out from the new record on day one of this tour, which is cool. We haven't really talked about the album or any of the fun stuff that's coming. But yes, there is a new album. And uh, we're going to start rolling things out after the holidays. So we'll have to be a little bit patient. But first, I got to mix the rest of the record. And then I don't feel like competing with Nike and Coca-Cola for your attention this holiday season. So we're going to let that all subside 
and then uh, we'll get into uh, rolling out some new tunes for everybody and uh, a whole record and a lot more touring and stuff like that. So this is the first, uh, what I would consider to be just a taste, like a little smattering or a sampling from the record. Um, the song's called Mnemonic. You can stream it anywhere that you consume music if you guys haven't listened to it. A um, couple notable things would be uh, we're starting to tune the guitars down again a little bit, so that's kind of fun. Feels good to do scratch that itch again, which is cool. And, uh, yeah, this is, uh, like I said, it's a pretty well-rounded taste of the record without sort of giving everything away. So let's get into that, and then we'll, uh, we'll rock on from there.
Sick. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that song is um, entitled Mnemonic because it's literally all about memory. And this is a um, sort of a micro theme for the new record. Uh, I've been sort of hinting at this with some themes for a while, but the uh, song is just filled with tiny little variations and stupid little things to constantly remember. So if you don't know what a mnemonic device is, it's sort of like, that's like, this song is like the physical embodiment of me trying to like remember a hundred things in, in a five minute piece of music. So cool. Um, yeah, if uh, anybody had anything that they wanted to sort of kick this off with, uh, put a little wind in our sail here, um, we'll just take a question. You guys can put your hands up. We'll just rock with something and, and go from there. Go ahead. Maybe one more time for the internet. How do you go about MIDI? Yeah, automating MIDI? Automating MIDI to yeah. your, yeah. Um, so, nerdy right away. Hell yeah. I mean, we are, okay, all the way. Um, yeah, so what he's asking about is sounds are changing. And you can see I'm perched up here on a bar stool. So, and everything's changed. How's it happening? Um, so I'm using, right now I'm just doing it with a USB-C cable. Um, and I'm just using an external MIDI channel in Logic. And then, you know, each piece of equipment, whether it's a Quad Cortex or a Helix or Kemper, anything, uh, has a sort of a MIDI language that it wants to see as far as program changes for presets and scenes for, that would be, you know, continuous controller message, so CCs. I just tend to operate it between those. The way I sort of do it is uh, every song gets a preset, and then I have about eight moves that I can make. Um, yeah, I use scenes because it's just like a real smooth and gapless way to kind of, you know, flip between various states. Um, yeah. Gapless. Let's go. All day. Now, now that, yeah, there's now the... It was shattered the glass ceiling, I suppose. Yeah, it's pretty exciting, actually. But, yeah, you can really push these things. So, yeah, basically, I'm just... Um, when I build a live session, I just you know bring the MP3s in. In this case, I'm using Jam Tracks, which uh, are available for my friends at Sheet Happens. You can get, get all of my music with my parts muted and out of the way, and you can do your own thing on top, or you can lift the lines from the book and play with the band. Um, so that's what you're hearing here. I just lay out the MP3 or the jam track, and then as the playhead's moving through, I literally just ask myself what needs to happen. Where am I in the song? What kind of, what kind of sound do I need? And then you just dr drop in. You know, Typically, the beginning of a song will be a program change that puts me in the preset that I need, and then I just drop you know, continuous controller messages. So MIDI's weird. It's offset by one, so zero equals one. So if I have eight moves I can make, I go zero through seven, and then I just drop those accordingly. Some are smoother than others. Some you might need to anticipate a little ahead of the grid or shift it by a couple ticks or whatever, just in case there's a little, you know. But there's a few sounds in there. For example, like here's my rhythm sound. It's like a straight ahead. It's the uh, purple channel of a rev generator. So we have those in the fractal now. And then I'm doing, this is like a Friedman lead. And then I have this thing, which is super fried. And that's with an octaver in front. And then I'm blending, uh, I have a drive block after the cab with uh, like just the slightest bit of bit crush. Yeah, I saw your head cocked to the side there. You're like, that's a no-no. But it's but it's it but it's in parallel. So run a drive block in parallel, a little bit of bit crush in there just to give it that fried sort of texture on top, and then that blends back into the signal chain, and then I widen it with a stereo chorus, and it goes to all my wet effects. So here's the this is like the drier version. There's like a room reverb on it just for a little bit of quick splash. And then I have a like a I call it fuzz cloud, which is like a more schmoozy version of the same thing. So for all this, nice kind of cloud to live on, but it's effectively built off the same thing. So those are just studio tricks I'm trying to recreate live, and then I just toggle between all those things. So, 
Yeah, I like a darker stereo delay, either the Bucket Brigade or like a Memory Man type circuit. That's my jam, 100%. Yeah, or I'll set up a dual delay and I'll EQ it and add a little modulation and kind of build my own custom delay. Something I like to do. Yeah. Anything sort of dovetailing off nerdery, like gear stuff? Is that how we're really just going to kick right off like that? It can be anything. You guys feel free to change lanes if you want. But yeah, right over here. Woo! Ah, that's how we're going to do it. That's perfect. Uh, I'll repeat your question for the internet for you, though. He asked what my favorite Tesseract song is. That's crazy. Um, I don't know. Probably Concealing Fate, I'd right, say. Well, off of Altered State, what's your favorite song by Tesseract? Um, probably... Uh, oh, I'm blanking on the... On the uh, it's the tune from Altered State. What is that song called? Uh... It's uh, it's it's escaping me. Don't put me on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's crazy, bro. My bad. I'm about to get heat tomorrow at the show, dude. <laughs> they're not watching this. Yeah. They're not. They're at the rainbow. Uh, Looking for Rod Jeremy. They're definitely disappointed. Can I ask um, one more question? Can I ask one more question to you? Sure. Um, I have a question on chords. Like, I noticed that a lot of your music for me has been like really uh, informative, right? Okay. Uh, to me, it seems like you're like running through a bunch of ideas and kind of circling back to them a lot yes. of the time. Yes. So like when you build chords and you're like, or when you, even when you improvise, I can say you're not improvising off melodies, you're improvising off like chord progressions. So to a degree. How do you build chords when you're improvising them? Um, well, I think maybe there's a misconception that improvisation is just about the concept of thinking about single notes. If you're thinking in triads and dyads, then chords are always happening. So um, not to say that that's how you're framing it, but um, Chords are always happening. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hook this into another question that gets asked commonly, which is when you write, do you write the melody first or do you write the chords first? And actually these, these apply. I know that's compositional. You're asking about improvisation, but they're one and the same because the idea would be that a melody arbitrarily in time is just happening with no context is just a melody. But if you've ever, if you've ever listened to like a really cool like, reharm of a song or something you can shine a different light on a very simple like i implore everyone to go after this and like youtube like sick happy birthday reharm and like you'll hear some like heady stuff you know and you're like whoa that's crazy um it's all about how you you know it's sort of the canvas on which you're you're painting on top of so um from like a composite or a, from an improvisational standpoint i suppose like if I'm, you know, so I'm in drop C. So if I just think about C minor. Like I'm just thinking about all of the notes that are available there. Now if I just start implying chord changes. There was like... Largely, that line is melodic, but to me, all of those notes in the lower register are given context. If I play the same three notes over and over again, he's shaking his head at me. So I'm thinking anymore. all of those notes are available in the key. I'm thinking about the chords. Like, imagine. And I'm just thinking C minor, but I'm trying to also consider that there's maybe a piece of music happening at the same time as well, right? It's a pretty rudimentary example, but right. trying to be very deliberate at showing you, like, here's me changing the chord, you know? Sick. So um, another way to do it would be, like, modal pivoting. So right. I could play C minor. Or I could go... So I'm sneaking in and out between minor and major. That was straight major, minor, though. I wouldn't really see that as even modal at that point. Would you see that as... I yeah, mean, because I don't like to thing. see it straight major and minor. I'm actually thinking Aeolian Mixolydian. I'm actually thinking... <laughs> So I'm actually trying to think, because like, 
again, just to go back, like I'm not trying to play happy birthday, <laughs> you know, so. It's not like it either. But, of course. But if I play flat seven with a with the with natural third, we're going to feel the more mix of thing. That's a little bit more interesting. Mm -hmm. Could also play sharp four. <laughs> Do the Lydian thing. Uh, that I can do. Uh, too soon, I guess, but um, yeah, so nobody got the reference. All right, cool. I'm going to park it there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so modal pivoting. Modal oh, pivoting. Awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. Of course. Of course. Cheers. Okay, anything, anybody else got one in the room that's sort of related to that? I think you need to use the microphone, sir. Go ahead, step up. Yeah, you got this. Uh, hi, Aaron. Hi. <laughs> First of all, um, you're basically teaching me how to play without you knowing that you are through your song, so thank you. That's very that. kind of you to say. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to ask was pertaining composition. The reason why I like your music so much is because it sounds technical, but it doesn't sound overbearing. You're not tapping for seven minutes straight. And when I listen to your songs, there's sections that I can, um, you know, hum back in my head and kind of mm -hmm. like remember, mm -hmm. which is not really all that popular in prog. I wanted to ask if when you're making your guitar lines, are you thinking like a guitar player or are you thinking like a singer? Because that is a concept that my guitar teacher kind of like explained to me. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, I think the obvious thing for me early on with composing this style was like, you know, finding, I don't want to say a template, but certainly a formula that allows me to like convey the ideas that I have in a way that's concise. And if you look at the genre at large, um, it can run the risk of maybe not to other musicians because we like are kind of here for it. Like tap at me for seven minutes. Like I'm here for it, you know, yeah. but, um, I think that uh, if you want to create like a big tent, so to speak, for your, you know, your, your listener base, I think that and you need to consider um, how to present that. And uh, I don't know why when, when we started kicking off like the advent of, of um, um, electronic music starting to become part of the like pop zeitgeist, it always sort of like intrigued me because like you'll have songs that are massive with no vocal. Or maybe there's a vocal that's like three words and it's chopped into a million pieces or whatever. Um, a lot of the time, though, these things are, you know, the drop hits and it's just a synth. I'm like, this is instrumental music. So yeah. why is there 10,000 people in a shed, you know, enjoying it and then there's only 1,000 people at the rock show? Like, that's peculiar to me. So I think the idea was trying to consciously present things in a palatable way. And repetition is um, largely a device that feels inclusive to the listener no matter what their sort of like musical ability is. Because think about it, if, 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 if that music speaks to a lot more people, what is it about that music that's really bringing you in? It's not because somebody's up there leaving it all on the stage and just like pouring it all into the neck of the instrument. It's more so about the sound and the feeling of a thing. Repetition is what allows the listener to feel like, oh, you brought that back. Like, I get it, you get it, you did it, I get it, we're together. Like, it's a linked kind of thing that makes the listener feel like a part of the music. So using a pop structure and using repetition as a device is like, you know, that's also how you finish songs that have like three or four parts and not having to cram like 12 parts into a song. All of those other parts should be on other songs on your EP, in my opinion. Unless you're the type of artist that does through composition that really is into that kind of stuff. That's fine. It just hasn't been what I'm interested in. I want to make concise songs that have a really solid identity. And um, yeah, so that's the compositional side. Am I thinking about being a vocalist like versus a, you know, a guitar player is sort of where I toggle between like how I sound in the verse or the chorus versus how I sound in the solo. So I put my guitar hat on when it's time to like take a solo and play some of you know, things that are filled with hammer-ons, maybe some tapping, maybe some things like that. But um, you know, when it comes to uh, you know, playing the verse, so to speak, um, I'd like to tr try to draw a straight line through the composition and also say, hey, like, you know, this, is the, 
this is sort of a, an explorative melodic idea that is setting the tone for the penultimate hook, which is the identity of the song. And then when the bridge comes around, you're ready for a solo. We haven't just gassed out on solos for two and a half minutes. It's like, oh, give me the solo. Oh, and now I get the chorus again. So it, it behaves more like conventional music that way. So that's, I don't know, it just seemed obvious to me, and that's just how I like to compose. So, yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Thank you, Aaron. Of course, you're very welcome. Okay, with, with that being said, maybe I'll toggle into another tune if you guys want to hear some, some music. So let's do that. I'm just going to change tunings here real quick. Also, yes, we have guitars to talk about, so feel free to ask questions, or if not, I'm going to tell you about them. Uh, all right, let's check this out. Do some, we'll do some stuff from Circadian, maybe. Cool. So let's go ahead. I'm going to do a tune called Lunatic.
Ah, oh, just a dreamy little fade out. I don't want to cut it. That'd be a brat. We're just going to live with that for a sec. Oh, it's so nice. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Anybody else got anything else they were dreaming of during that? Okay. You, you got to use the mic, though, my dude. Yeah. How's it going, Aaron? My name is Pedro. Nice to meet you, dude. Good to meet you, too. Thanks so much. Thank you for being out here. Um, I have a question. So, Tossin has his thumping. Marty Friedman has his sick bands. <laughs> you know, all these si signature guitars have awesome things about them. I love, I love your um, slides. Okay. Where do your slides, or what do you get inspiration from, to, or what uh, guitars do you get inspiration from for those slides? Mm. Interesting. Um, Thank you, by the way. Um, I love all your playing, by the way, as well. Sorry. But I, I <laughs> just, just the slippery stuff. I just, I, I, it's, some, it's something about those slides, man. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's like, I think it's part and parcel with that vocal approach. You know, if you think about, um, you know, um, let me get a tone together. Um, you know, maybe in a, maybe very much in a place like this, you'd walk through the door and hear something like. Maybe, I don't know. That's what I heard from a friend. I don't know. Maybe that happens in here. I'm not really sure. Um, that's very unique to the guitar. Yeah. You don't hear a vocalist warm up on like stepped pentatonics. Or if you do, maybe they're, they're, they're trying to emulate a guitar for some strange twisted reason. I don't really know. You don't hear a piano player warm up like that. You definitely don't hear a horn player warm up like that. It's very guitaristic. There's a lot of things about the guitar that are so, we're so influenced by the way it looks as far as like the box. You hear this all the time, playing in the box, right? Yeah. So I think when you try to play, uh, you know, with more of this uh, attention towards being, being the vocalist, for example, or emulating a vocal, you know, you, you have to think about the instrument linear up and down the same way maybe a horn player or a vocalist thinks about their range, right? But visually, that's at odds with that concept. So we can play things on one string. That's part of it. And if you want to sound interesting while you do that and you continue, um, you know, to have, uh, you know, unique or interesting phrasing, you're going to automatically find yourself doing some of those things, I think. Um, but, uh, to be more specific about the influence, I would say, I don't know. I, my, when I was starting to play guitar, my dad was really on a Pat Metheny kick, you know? Yeah. There's a guy, right? Absolutely. I got to see him for the first time, uh, earlier this year. Um, and I've been playing guitar for more than half my life now. He's probably one of my biggest influences and, um, it's just unbelievable to, to see him do the thing. Up close in person, I've been sort of biting bits and pieces. And not so much like the, the sound of Pat uh, as far as his harmony or maybe some of his choices or whatever, but more so how he makes the instrument speak. There are other guys that do it too. Um, you know, uh, an unrelated name that kind of maybe, but still in the jazz world that comes to, to mind is like a Wes Montgomery or a George Benson or something like that where, you know, and it's funny because like what I do, I don't think really dovetails with that much at all it's like i mean i guess i'm playing like george benson lines with a distortion i guess or pat metheny lines with like with d beats like cat cat and just like trying to do that thing i don't know maybe that's maybe that's the sound um but i'll try to like play you a bit of an example so if i was to play like on one string right um let's say g string only <laughs> And there, I'm even limiting myself. To, I'm trying not to do too many ham runs. I'm just trying to use one finger and get around. That sounds to me, you know, fairly rudimentary, but it sounds vocal. If I limit myself to one string, how am I going to sound interesting and not just go... No. Okay, we're a guitar, so we can use other strings. That's fine, too, but I'm trying to limit myself there. If I do with an octave, that commandeers the entire hand. I do this quite a bit. You know, this type of sound, there's only so much to work with, so I'm trying to pull, like, articulation out of some 
something from nothing, effectively. The whole hand is busy. Sometimes I'll maybe go, I'll just tickle the low string. Right? But I don't really have a lot that I can work with there. There's a sound to octaves, though, that um, isn't like putting on an octaver. That's a different sound, in my opinion, because it's so tracking one-to-one. But there's so many, like, idiosyncrasies with, like, guitars are rarely ever actually in tune. So you get that beating between those, you know, those almost in-tune strings that sounds really vocal. Maybe, like, if you had backing vocals. Like, if you had a stack of backing vocals underneath and they aren't hard-tuned, but you just get that diversity in pitch, it's kind of like having a pad or something. And then in recent years, I got into using like stereo chorus on my sound. You can hear it's kind of wide. Mm-hmm. It's kind of got some mod to it. It's a little trippy. Yeah. That to me is like the next step towards being as vocal as I can. So I'm kind of like, I guess, in a crude way, channeling Pat or something. And then also just trying to like make the most with very little amounts. I mean, a lot of, of, of the compositions, you know, that, uh, that I make are, are largely rooted in limitation as a concept. Because one of the biggest things early on, and I'm sure we all suffer from this, is you open Logic or you pick up your guitar and then you're like, I'm going to write something and then yeah. nothing happens because you're like, you know, option paralysis, right? So I think like setting the parameters. I used to do this thing early on actually where I would, um, I would take a, a dice and I would assign like different attributes to it. So string skipping, for example, or playing on one string or you know, wide intervallic playing or whatever, and I would assign them to numbers on a piece of paper, and then I would roll the dice twice. And then I would have to combine both those two. And then I'd be like, okay, cool, I'm making a song out of this. So that's a pretty, like, nerdy sort of D&D way to, like, get after some songwriting, but it's cool, you know? You you corner yourself, and then you'll find yourself creating with less. So it's kind of a... Hopefully that helps. Dude, thank you so much. Of course, my pleasure, of course. Somebody else got another? Anybody else? Feel free to approach. Approach the microphone, my friend. Oh, fight to the death. I think he was adjusting the mic. A we'll do. No, no, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> no, so we'll we'll here. go here, then we'll go here, and then we'll do another two. Go ahead, my friend. Uh, so first of all, the dice thing reminds me of an exercise a buddy told me about, where we would just throw chords into a hat, and you'd pick yep. two and go between them as fast yep. as possible. Uh, but if it's cool, if I do two questions. Sure. Um, go ahead. First of all, I should have asked this after the fractal conversation, but when you got to that tone that you call kind of fried, yeah. I think that's very much what a lot of us would consider like the kind of the signature sound for you. It's what is at the front of the mix a lot. Sure. And I'm kind of curious where that sound comes from, like if there are particular artists or pedals or anything that caused you to put together that specific blend of flavors. Hmm. So in, in, there's a good theme here in this, in tonight, which is we're talking about making the guitar vocal, right? So in an attempt to continue to try to, I mean, push the envelope on every subsequent release, of course, always having new tricks. Um, I'm always thinking about ways that I can do that. So on the way forward, it was like, let's track all the harmonies in pairs. So instead of just doing the, you know, a third up thing and just kind of put it somewhere like mono or just like pan to the left a little bit or something to give it some space, I was kind of like, this is going to be a pain, but let's track every set of harmonies in a, in a pair to pan them hard left, hard right, or, you know, to a degree, maybe 30, 30 or something like that. And that's like a st- taking a stab at this like backing vocal thing. Usually when you track a vocalist, you'll get the main, then you'll get like some supporting mains, and then you'll do the like wide sort of choral, you know, pad where you take those, you compress them harder, you put a little modulation on them, you really tuck it in. That's how like you listen to the radio and someone opens their mouth and they sound massive is it's studio trickery so guitar solos and like guitar lines are always recorded like fairly you know basic it's like oh we tracked the guitar it's over but on it like you know we have so much real estate in our music for guitar there's no carve out for vocal this is the focal point so i'm always trying to figure out how to take up more space so um with Circadian, um, we started to work with a producer who actually, he's from Toronto, but he lives in LA now. His name's Sam Guyana. And Sam had never done an instrumental record or anything in the progressive space. In fact, Sam is almost strictly a pop punk producer, which is kind of cool because it does suit the intervals aesthetic. But 
it allows us to present the music, I think, in a way that's like not mixed by insert my friend from the last 10 years or the other guy that you got all listen, you know, everyone, we all listen to records mixed by that dude. And then the other one, there's so many, you know, well, not so many, there's only so many names in the genre. So I really wanted to like break out and give intervals its own sonic sort of um, fingerprint, if you will. So uh, I was picking Sam's brain a lot about like, you know, how do we do this? Like, what are other ways that we can make guitars pop? And on Circadian, we started hinting at it a little bit. There's definitely some parts of melodies that just start exploding. You just hear all this like high-end content in the sides. Things are like kind of fuzzy and clipped, almost like the way you would like overdrive a vocal mic and you get that really kind of like saturated and kind of, you know, harmonic rich type sound. How do we do it with guitar? Well, you do all the same tricks you would do to a vocal. So we started doing it with Little Alter Boy. Um, which is a Sound Toys plugin, and it's a form and shifter with a drive circuit, yeah. and you can just like fry it, basically, for lack of a better term, and then shift the sort of formant, which makes it sound a little more vocal, so to speak. And that algorithm is more suited for vocals and not guitar. So when you start going, you start getting that thing on it, it starts to sound really strange. And when you tuck that under the main line, stuff starts jumping like crazy. Mm -hmm. So that was a fun way to do it. And then on the new record, we have a bunch of different tricks. We're doing it with Real ADT. We're doing it with Sound Toys Decapitator, literally just all buttons in on Decapitator, fry it. You take a duplicate, destroy it, and then just like bring it up on the fader the same way you would you do it on a bus or just kind of blend that, which is what I'm doing there where I have this like layer that's happening and it's intermittently kicking on and off just to highlight particular moments of the vocal, the vocal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's where that sort of comes from, is just applying vocal studio trickery to guitars. Super cool. Um, yeah. And the second one would be just, like, obviously you're an incredible guitar player, but, but, like, everybody wants to feel challenged. So I'm wondering if there are any techniques that you really think about as having been a challenge early on or maybe still are a challenge, and if there's anyone out in the scene that you're kind of, you know, thinking, like, uh, looking to for inspiration or looking maybe up to a little bit? For sure. Good question. Um, so I try not to view the instrument like a sport. Um, I think that it would be to my detriment given the sound and approach to the music. I think it's largely about the vibe and the identity of a song. I really want that first idea to strike me and for me to chase it in a way that's uninhibited, not like technique forward, like it has to be like this or I have to force this one thing. Definitely songs in the catalog that have some technical stuff. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, Lock and Key is all largely rooted around hybrid picking, things of that nature. So it can happen. But I'll tell you this, it's challenging enough to just play these lines live for me because I am very uncomfortable with standing still. Mm -hmm. Actually sitting and playing guitar is also really a challenge for me. I don't know why. I guess I'm just a really anxious person. Um, so jumping off the kick drum makes anything you do pretty hard, I'd say, you know? Um, so I'm not really so concerned about, like, these types of things on the instrument. It's all about the songs and then bringing them to life in an exciting way for the audience. That's really sort of the focal point. Um, if I have anyone that I'm looking at in terms of inspiration or somebody who's really pushing me, like, the summer I had the pleasure of teaching and performing at John Petrucci's Guitar Universe, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, other, besides sharing a beer in the lobby with him, watching Guthrie play waves like where you're standing and he was here and I'm there and I was like standing there with Tosin and Tosin said like, I've never wanted to start a riot because of guitar playing before. <laughs> he literally said that to me. <laughs> and it's true. Um, he is the most prolific guitar player of our generation, I imagine, uh, in my opinion. I think Guthrie is, is that guy. Um, so he constantly pushes me. Um, I, had, I had a day where uh, there was time off, and I went to one of his seminars at the camp, and I just sat in the back of the room. And, you know, I've seen all those videos of him giving seminars in the UK where he's, like, showing people how to play with no picking, and he's playing, like, whole etudes with just the left hand. And I'm like, I need to sit in the room and see this man do his thing. So still impresses me to this day. Marcos Fogli is still that guy as well for me. I, I'm blessed to have featured him on the last album as well, which is incredible. Marco's amazing. Um, one of those guitar players that rides the line between being 
exceptionally proficient as a guitar player, but also being highly vocal. Very interesting from a melodic standpoint. And the dude who makes me want to quit right now is Matteo Mancuso. That, oh. that, that dude, I mean, no pick, open hand. The tone is ferocious. His swing is crazy. Like, I don't play guitar like that, you know? Just watching <laughs> him do his thing, being able to play changes like that. And he's so free, especially with the open hand. Completely uninhibited. Nobody's playing guitar like him. So, yeah, that's the stuff that kind of makes me sit up straight. All right, awesome. Thanks a lot, man. Of course. Thank you. Appreciate that. Do we want to do one more and then I'll slide into another tune or something like that? Or maybe, yeah, yeah, go ahead. That's right. You, you did that one. Let's go. Do it. Hey, yeah. Nice to be here. Um, just a couple of quotes. Like, first thing was, like, the way you talking about the dice roll sort of thing just reminds me of, like, my experiences with game jams. So, which kind of bleeds into the two couple of questions I have is, okay. have you ever, like, been interested, in, have you ever, like, had the chance to work within, like, composing for video games at all, or...? I haven't, but uh, there is there has been some opportunity as of late. Um, very preliminary conversations, which but of, I would love to do do so if possible. Touring makes that really hard to do. Yeah, the, which leads to the next question I had was like, if you were given the opportunity, what sort of things are you looking for within like a games development company? What what sort of thing you look for if you, in terms of like working with them? What would you want out of that? Is this a sneaky pitch, my guy? I can either confirm nor deny. Um, I mean, I would think, I, I think intuitively I would have to connect with the game. I think I, I intuitive, intuitively would have to connect with whatever the storyline is or the character. Um, you know, like I don't see myself doing the Mick Gordon eight string gent, like Doom soundtrack. Uh, you know, I think it's incredible what Mick did, but that's not my sound, you know? Um, I don't know. I think I fancy my my approach to something like that being more in line with something real, real colorful and and sort of dreamy. Like I don't want to be super on the nose and just go ahead and say Sonic. I know you're looking for it, but um, would do though. Would do. Um, I don't know. Something in that world. I think this kind of music suits. I mean, often people draw parallels between like, oh, this sounds like some Dragon Ball music or some anime type beat, you know, and like, that's cool. I, I, I don't really take direct influence from that kind of stuff. My first console was a Sega Genesis though. So that sound, as far as video game music, like those OG soundtracks to the like staple games from the nineties and stuff, that is my childhood. So Dude, same. that same. would make sense. Same as mine as well. Yeah. So I don't know if I think the company's doing something cool and I like the project and I had time, time is the hard part. It's always the way, isn't it? Anyway, That's thank you very part. much. Of course. My pleasure. Cool. So uh, here's what I'll do. Let's talk about these. And maybe I'll do a tune with one. Um, before I switch off, though, so we are here at Care of Schechter. And um, you're looking at an array of my wonderful signature models, which is really cool to say. Um, so I was blessed with the opportunity in, in early 2021 to develop a model with the Schechter Diamond series with the goal of building something that has the things I like about a guitar. Um, maybe pushes some boundaries like a little bit as far as like including some specs maybe I'd like to see at a guitar at a particular price point and maybe, you know, be inclusive of some of the other details that I think maybe the market was, you know, had an appetite for at the time. So the idea with, uh, with this one, um, the AM6 and the AM7 was to do a Diamond Series guitar that features a few things that you don't normally see. So these ones are really straight ahead in terms of being a basswood body, but these guys feature this lovely Wenge neck as well, which is really cool. And I have a bunch of guitars in my collection that have exotic necks like this. And I was like, you know, you don't really see that so much on like a straight ahead, almost super strat style thing. You always see the maple and stuff like that. So that was sort of the ethos there. Um, as you can see here, this is my USA model. Today I got a facelift with these lovely zebra bobbins because we got two in the rig now, so we don't want to confuse ourselves on stage. So um, difference here being lightweight alder body, maple neck, maple board. You can see the headstock's a little bit different as well. Really important to me with a USA guitar that we could do a one-piece quarter saw neck. When you have a tilt-back headstock like this, it's not possible to do 
based on the, the, the construction and the manufacturing of those. So that's what steered me towards this. I love this headstock, but we wanted to elevate things a little more so you can see those tuners, which is kind of cool. They're a little aggressive. Uh, the regular tuning keys will be in the case if this isn't your thing. If the like, utilitarian, like brutalist thing isn't your style, then you can put the regular keys back on. They'll be in the case. Um, but yeah, the, the, that's sort of the difference there. I was given the opportunity to basically choose existing silhouettes and, and parts that were already in the design language for the Schechter Diamond Series and assemble something that you know speaks to me. I chose a, an arch top because um, I, I sort of toe the line between you know, I like a super strat style guitar. You guys have probably seen me play some carved top things before. So I wanted to sort of meld things. Um, I, I am very fond of, of the arch top super strat look. So I was like, well, let's try to be sleek and low profile as possible and do that. But let's do, you know, dual humbucking with a two point vintage style non locking trim with a five way. Do a cool neck on it. Keep things really simple though. It's an ebony board, wenge neck, and a basswood body. So there's only three materials. These guitars only have two. So we're definitely doing the minimalist thing, which is really cool. You don't need to have seven pieces, 11 pieces in the neck to have a cool guitar. That's definitely not how it works. In fact, I believe the less you interrupt all of these pieces, the more they ring and vibe together. So, um, and there are other individuals in the guitar space that would certainly corroborate that, I believe. Paul Reed Smith is exceptionally outspoken about that. The idea being that if a guitar is just one solid block, the less you can take away, take away, take away, leaves you with something that rings more true than interrupting it and splicing it and putting it all together. So sometimes we look at a spec sheet and we go, wow, I want all the things, but it might just ring like that, you know, versus this, you know. So um, let's switch lanes. So you've heard the USA guitars. Um, the first one I was playing is set up in drop C. I might as well give you the super nerdy details. I use D'Addario NYXL strings. My drop C gauge is 11 to 56. This tour started, uh, this guitar started its life on tour 10 to 52 in drop D, which is a little heavy, actually. 10 to, 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 I, I've been a nines guy. We migrated to tens in the studio for intonation and just like a little bit more kind of confidence as far as like chordal things. Um, but I'm always at odds with string tension. It's like the right hand wants a heavy string, the left hand wants a light gauge. So today we went D'Addario NYXL 9.5 to 50. That pack doesn't exist, we just discarded the low string and we put a 50 on here. Feels really good, I was actually really enjoying playing this. So that's cool. Also these guitars have silent springs in them. Oh, you can't see, I thought the back plate was off. That was, that was real smooth. There's two silent springs in here, two, two springs set up really into that. I feel like you get a really smooth action when you actually put those springs over tension rather than three that are kind of working. You can have two, really spread them out kind of in an angle like that, kind of the Van Halen style. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what's going on here. Pickups designed by me, five-way switch. And uh, Lumen Lay, just beautiful carbon fiber reinforced necks. All the USA guitars come with this wonderful back plate uh, or neck plate on them that feature my Intervals Infinity logo. And I love them. I'm obsessed with these. But uh, this is also my muse. So let's toggle over to that and I'll do a tune from the way forward with this one. Cool. I wish there was a way to do this. I'm trying to consider that there are people walking around. <laughs> so he asked if... if uh, if the USA guitars were 510 bridges. These are go to 510s. The ones on the USA model are actually designed by Schechter. For, of course, two point, non locking, vintage style, which in my opinion is the way. I like a Floyd. I don't like messing with a Floyd. They're sick. They're probably my favorite feeling trim. I feel like you get a low tension experience with all the things you like about trim, but then you get all the headaches of, you know, having to manage that. So, well, once it's dialed, it's dialed, but yeah. So the cool thing about these though, is at the price point, these are real Goto Japanese pieces of hardware on here, which you don't usually see. Um, and this is why Schecter is so cool is because, you know, they sort of let me, you know, insist that there's certain things that that I think we needed to feature. Um, 
one of my biggest things with with any instrument is the contact points. You know, we think so much about what it's made of and all these types of things, but the contact points are so important. Like the hardware is the thing that's gonna, really going to get worked. You know, so not to say that companies aren't doing cool. You know, um, OEM made to measure bridges for their you know or tuners or what what have you overseas, but some stuff works really well and it's kind of hard to knock the industry standard stuff. So steel block in the trem, two point non-locking, Godo style, well, in, in this case, actual Godo. So cool, I'm gonna start, stop jibber jabbering. Let's do a tune from the way forward. I think I'm gonna do Leave No Stone. There's a whole section in the middle of this song that absolutely requires a metronome in my ear. We're gonna see how good my timing is. It's the old uh, like drop the metronome experiment in the middle of this one. So we'll see. We'll see. All right.
Thank you. That was a Hail Mary in the middle there. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions about the guitars, perhaps, or could be anything at all, but since we kind of talking about these a little bit. Uh... Well, seeing as you just nailed that, um, I have two questions, really. Seeing as you just nailed that, how do you practice your timing? How do you work on developing that internal metronome? Ooh. And then after that, just what's it like, you know, sort of being able to make your own signature guitar? Wow. Um, you know, t the timing thing is, is interesting. We, I think most musicians have, like, the proclivity to rush, uh, given, especially that I live most of my life on a metronome during the show. Um, so the, dr the, the drummer is, is, is certainly in charge uh, when it comes to dictating that. We had a show on this tour in St. Louis. We lost the playback, uh, everything. Um, certain pieces of gear died. Other things didn't. Uh, we carried on, as you do. You don't just fold when it happens. You keep playing the song. Frantically, you know, crew members are firing gear up and everything came back. Playback came in, still on click. So that's shout out to Nathan. That's not me. I'm just playing him. So um, I can't say that I practice time intently like that. Like, oh, what happens if? I'm definitely not thinking like that. I do love the exercise, though, where you play to a metronome and then every few bars it starts to cut out and you have to find one. I think that's a healthy thing to do. I think guitar players are really bad at rushing. I think we all have the, you know, like I said, the inclination to, to, to rush given nothing to play to. So in a moment like that, I'm overplaying my hand in my head going, continue counting. It's slower than you think. It's slower than you think. It's slower than you think. And then, you know, and that's a tough one too because it's divisible by three. There's a rest before the band fades out. Then there's a count on its own. Then I got to do the thing. So, yeah, I don't know. Just, uh, I got lucky on that one. But anyway, uh, your second question, which is what's it like to, to, to design a signature guitar? It's been amazing. I mean, uh, I've been afforded the latitude to spread out and make stuff that excites me and you know, that holds up on the road and makes people happy. And like, that's all you want, you know, if it's like, it's one thing for me to be stoked on it, but it's another thing for people to spend their hard earned money on, you know, these ideas of mine and to, to love them. You know, I, I've, we, I see them at shows, I see them at clinics and stuff. People, you know, pull it out of their case and it's all worn in and they're doing their thing with it. And that makes me super happy. So yeah. Um, Shakti has been incredible to work with. The answer is, Rarely no. So that's what you want. You know, I'm going to start pushing the envelope, though. But <laughs> Adam's shaking his head saying no. That's the first time I've ever seen him say no. So there you go. Um, but it's been really awesome. And uh, the thing that matters the most, I think people ask often, like, you know, uh, oh, I've seen you play a bunch of guitars. Like, why this one or why this company or whatever? And for me, it's people. It's 2023. Guitars are all sick. I'm in a room full of sick guitars. You know what I mean? Guitars are all sick. It's all about people, relationships. So, yeah, that's good. Okay, anybody else in the audience got something for You may or may not have to use that microphone, my friend. Are you down? Let's do it. Yeah? No, he's going to no, he's gonna bring it to you. No, the, the internet needs to hear your lovely voice. I like your T-shirt, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank Let's you. go. Um, one statement, then one question. Sure. Uh, the statement is, you mentioned about um, Pat before. Yes. And I'm a 70s guy. I'm old as one here. But anyway, so um, I would, without the flamenco touch, I put you close to uh, Al Demiol in a sense because your technique is awesome. Oh, wow. So how would you... Yeah, I like that? Al. Yeah, for sure. I have a lot of respect for Al. I haven't spent as much time... Maybe, you, yeah, you're putting me on, I guess. I should... Uh, no, I should probably dive in, honestly. The name comes up often. Recently watched his interview with my friend Rick Beato and That's that was amazing. Yeah. You know, um, I, I can't cite him as a direct influence because um, I just don't know enough. But I have a high respect for his playing and, and the things that I, you know, the, the things that I have absorbed. Yeah, he's incredible. The Pat thing speaks to me a little more, though, because he's so... Well, it's funny. He'll... Because he can, he can flip the pendulum in both directions. He can be highly palatable and very melodic and then also very avant-garde. And it's like, Pat, what are you doing? 
you know? But I like that, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm not that guy. I live over here, not over there. But, yeah. Um, just really into that, that, you know, vocal, very inside, very sweet, very easy to... It's like you don't disagree with anything the man has to say. You're just like, yes. Yes, that's it, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's cool. You put me on, though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna dig, to dig in more on, on Al. Yeah. This is a question. Uh, you mentioned about your inner metronome, and I was thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and it goes back to a compositional concept. Why, okay. do, why is there a lot of, and this may be what God gave you, why is there a lot of tempo changes? I mean, not, not tempo change, but, but, but signature changes in your music. A mm. lot. I mean, obviously that's, that's part of you, but how does, how does that come about? Yeah, I mean, so... I run the risk of, of, of maybe belittling the question by, by giving you this answer, but the majority of the music is in four, uh, or sometimes it's divisible by three, so it could be like a 6-8 a feel or a 3-4 feel or something. A lot of the time, though, these things are divisible by four. Second song I played tonight, Lunatic, oscillates between 7-8 and bars of 4-4. Four, four. So, um, yes, I will do odd, odd meters, um, I think what it is, though, is there's a vocabulary in modern metal that really plays with, with time as, as, uh, as an elastic, if that makes sense. So we can still live in four and insinuate other things. So a lot of it has to do with blurring the bar line. So the first song I played tonight, um, Mnemonic, which has that, those groups of five. In fact, I can probably just toggle over to it um, as an example. This is, this, is, this is probably one of the more straight ahead kind of examples of this. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play the track so you'll, you'll hear it. Um, so coming out of the first verse, this is where we set up that theme that goes da 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 this whole thing. So I'll give a little context so we can all kind of tap our feet. But I promise you this is in four. I'm a little late, I'm a little late. It's coming up here, it's coming up here. Right? Okay. So the pattern is going to be in five, or it's a fives pattern, but this never stops. So I'm just blurring the bar line. It's five over four. It's just four. It's just a long sentence structure. That's the rep takes that long to come back around. And that's because if you have, you know, if you have four apples and five oranges and you keep playing this game, it takes five repetitions to come back around. So it really is, it's all about just blurring the bar line. Long sentence structure phrases that take a long time to, to equate. So I'm not the only guy doing it. I'm pilfering from all of my contemporaries. This is largely the Meshuggah game, the periphery game, the animals game, Tesseract's whole world is built on this. Um, Ackle has a proclivity to the number three, though, which is way different. You know, there's certain, like, dimensions that are accessible when something has that kind of waltzy feel or that shuffle feel to it. And that's just based on the numbers. But a lot of these things are just sort of, like, arbitrary sequences of numbers that are spread out over a really even count. But all the, it's all about the groove, though. You know, so something that's trippy there is there's like a lot of really significant beats where the band drops out, drops out on one, comes back on two, you know, where the snare comes back in, things like that. But you never fumble the groove, you know. If, you, if There's a, a piece of artwork that accompanied the, the, the single. If you go on socials or you go on my Instagram, whatever, you can see it. It's the Hamza, which is the hand with the eye in the middle. And if you look at each individual digit, it's made, each individual digit on the hand is made of a different material. You have, like, flesh and bone, and you have, like, steel, and you have, like, you know, rusty brass kind of thing. If you look at the pinky, the pinky is pixelated. It's almost as if it's not really there. That's the da-da-da-da, and then the implied rest. Because the whole thing is it's a four count. You hear da-da-da-da, which is one, two, three, four, but... It's a rolling group of five because the rest is, is not implied. The rest is played. So against that four groove, you're getting this rolling fives thing, but the fifth count in the measure is a rest, which really is what throws the brain for a loop. But if you look at that piece of artwork, it was completely unintentional. We chose the Hamsa because, um, like I said, the new album is, is 
you know, the, the mnemonic concept is a micro concept in the larger macro concept of the album being largely rooted in memory. So to show a physical manifestation of the idea of a mnemonic device is very challenging. So I went through like encyclopedias about the art of memory and you often see the hand represented as a way to remember complex sequences of information. You'll, you'll notice in the artwork as well, there's Roman numerals, as, uh, which sort of implies the five thing, but the hand is largely like the idea about being able to assign chains of information to different digits. So each individual digit has its own unique properties, and you have this sort of invisible pixelated rest on the pink completely by accident, totally sells the, the theme of the song, I'll take it all day. So probably a little more than you bargained for there, but hell yeah. Um, let's see, where are we at? Okay, we got probably enough time to do, if you want to approach the mic, let's do some more questions, and I'm going to play maybe one or two more, and, and then that's that. So, Aaron. How you doing? Big fan. Um, Thank you. So, you have, like, you have been, like, collaborating with, like, a lot of instrumental bands. Yep. Like, other, like, Animals, Leaders, uh, Silverstein, Pliny, Polyphia, which, by the way, uh, Sweet Tea is my favorite solo. Sick. Thank one you. One of my favorite solo of all time. So, and, like... Out of all of those bands, like which one w was your favorite? Like not throwing shade to other bands, but like to which, contribute like yeah. a guest solo too. Yeah, and like who would you like to collab to collaborate next? Maybe Periphery. <laughs> um, out of all of those, the Silverstein collab is the one that means the most to me because discovering the waterfront was so massive when I was in high school. The fact that. I have a song on Spotify that says Silverstein featuring intervals is insane to me. Um, doesn't really compute in my brain still, you know. Um, so that, that one just is sentimental. Um, you know, they're a pop punk band, largely, or post hardcore band, you know. Um, so that's a cool one. And that sort of validates... I think that largely validates the approach I'm trying to take with instrumental music, which is that it, this thing can function in a more mainstream sort of realm to a degree. Um, I have two guest solos with Polyphia. That's cool too. Um, Tim gave me the opportunity to just like choose stuff on both of those. Or I think Persevere might have been like, hey, do a solo over this. And Sweet Tea, I got to pick from sort of a selection of, of songs. I like that one too. It's pretty fun. Um, and then who could, you know, if I want to collaborate with some, I don't know. I want to, I'm down for the left to center stuff. I think it would be too obvious to do, an, you know, I'd be like, I'm down to do enough. If the homies hit me up, I'm always game. Um, but I don't know. I like the stuff that's sort of outside the box. Like I would love to, well, I don't really know. I don't, I don't want to say it out loud because I don't want to impose what I'm doing on anything or say like, you know, oh, I fancy myself. Like, I could hear myself playing over this thing, you know? I'll say this. There are four collabs on the new record. None of them are guitar players. Very interesting. Your face, you just changed like three different emotions there. That was, that was cool. <laughs> You're like, damn. You're like, who? Wait, what? Yeah. So... Um, that's deliberate in the sense that the, the album didn't need more guitar playing, you know? Uh, what it needed was some external voices um, that had influence over more of the compositional and more like sound design sort of realm. So um, a lot of artists that I don't think people in our world in the guitar community and in the instrumental community are even gonna be familiar with. Um, track one on the album is a collab with my favorite UK drum and bass duo. So it's like real UK drum and bass breaks with like seven string intervals stuff. So like really starting to break new ground. I'm not gonna say much more about that, but there's stuff that is not within the realm of what intervals has done before on this record. Um, but very much also the most like concise and homogenous version of like the in time sound with shades of circadian and stuff that was going on with the shape of color and the way forward. It is like a really strong melting pot, but we're branching in other directions too. So is there also like a keyboardist? Like yeah, yes. A lot of the stuff is keys forward. So the drum and bass stuff. These guys are producers. So they're playing keys. They're making breaks and glitchy drum stuff. 
Um, and then, you know, there's contributors that are just keys forward. Um, like, I'll give you one, for example. My friend Julian Pollock, he goes by J3PO. He plays with Marcus Miller. He's also collaborated with people in the sort of snarky puppy world. And he's also the guy at Sequential for synth stuff and Omnisphere. Like, he blessed us with some roads and some, you know, some cool, like, saucy analog brass synth type stuff. So, yeah, it's stuff like that, you know? So... Solid question, my dude. Thank you. I think we're going to do... Yeah, we got five more minutes, so I think I'm going to hit one more tune, and then uh, we'll hang out for a little bit. It'd be cool. Um, should I play the bowling ball? You guys want to hear that? Yeah, okay. And then I'll tell you about that real quick. Okay. Yeah. Nice. You had me at bowling ball. <laughs> That's dope. So we've been getting asked questions about this one. <laughs> Adam doesn't want to answer them. <laughs> He's like, leave me alone. I can't hydro dip your phone or whatever, or your shoes. Um, so yeah, this is an AM7. This is that, which is crazy. But the Schechter Custom Shop blessed me with this wonderful hydro dip. They're one of the original, um, I mean, Schechter is like the original Los Angeles Custom Shop. They have the most pedigree for things that look like this. So um, if you're not familiar with the process, they take a guitar, they dip it in like a, like a kiddie pool or like a bucket full of, you know, like water and oil paint. And it comes out looking like this, which is cool. Uh, there is an Evertune on here as well, which is interesting. This is an experiment. We're trying to figure out if I like this or not. So why not change everything? But largely, this is that guitar. And uh, just one for me. So I'm going to do a song called String Theory, and then uh, and then we'll we'll go from there.
This is usually where I just shout out the crowd. Feel free to scream a little bit if you guys want. Or not. No. <laughs> no, don't do that. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for spending your evening here. Really cool to do a couple nights in L.A. Never been to Guitar Center Hollywood. This is really, really sick. So thank you to Guitar Center Hollywood and to Schechter and D'Addario for, for, and, for, and to you guys for showing up. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Aaron, real, real quick. We're going we're gonna to do a lightning round. This is the lightning round of questions that came in off oh, the stream. Light. Okay, let's go. So uh, Angel wants to know. When can we expect the USA Schecter to come out? Soon? That's how he says <laughs> Really soon. Really soon. Okay, really, cool. Re really soon. And, yeah. then, and when is the new record coming out? Uh, ideally before the end of the first quarter of the new year. Excellent. So we're going to start rolling more tunes out after Christmas. All right, so now this is the profound uh, end of the lightning round. Craig wants to know... How do you see yourself progressing as a player over the next 10 years? Uh, whoa. <laughs> my whole life just flashed before my eyes. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'm really happy with, you know, I mean, I don't want to sound complacent. I think that there's always room for growth. I think every album we demonstrate, we being myself, the rhythm section, and everybody, all the players, um, not just musically, but engineers, producers, like everybody that we sort of work with, I think we've all demonstrated that we're, we're pushing further and further. This next record that we're about to put out is leaps and bounds beyond Circadian, which I actually thought was like an exponential jump from the way forward. So we're uh, I'm trying to do that thing Apple's doing where they're like, it's 11 times faster. And the old one came out like four weeks ago. You know, um, I guess we're trying to do that. I, like, I can't write albums that fast, but... I'm not really sure. I don't want to set boundaries or unreal, un, unreasonable or unrealistic expectations. I think, like, to kind of double back on, on what I was saying before, I don't see the instrument as a sport. This isn't about trying to constantly push myself to a place where, you know, I regret a bunch of decisions. Like, we have a saying in our camp where something's really hard or we're struggling and everyone starts chanting, he does it to himself. He does it to himself. So that's, I don't want to find myself, like, 40 years old and regretting that I just kept snowballing in that direction. I want to figure out a way to say more with less, allow the songs to speak more. I probably need to chill out. Everything's really up-tempo and quite, like, dense as far as, I'd, I, you know, I listen to, you know, for example, a Tesseract where, you know, there's a lot of space in the music, certainly a lot of moments where they're just beating you with riffs, but there's also a lot of space. And I spent a lot of time listening to music like Tycho or Calm Trues or, you know, some things like that where I'm like, wow, there's so much space in this music. So try to chill out, say more with less, continue writing interesting songs that have unique identities and just keep going. If I'm still doing this in 10 years, that's, that's enough, I think. So that'd be cool. Let's do that. 
All right, great. Well, we are all very excited to see what you have in store for us. And so I just want to say a special shout out to Schechter and Diderio for helping us put this thing together. And let's make some noise for Aaron. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We're going to say goodbye to everybody who's watching at home on the streams. So we'll see you all in the future. Make sure you check out the AM6 and the link in our description. And uh, we're going to do a little autograph signing. So we'll see you guys later. Au revoir. Thanks, everyone.